Good day and welcome to the Leading with Nice interview series podcast. My name is Matthew Ewell and we want to help you inspire others, build loyalty and get results. Now today, as always, because I only do things that I think is awesome, I'm really excited about today's guest. And I was just telling him, uh, Drew Hayden Taylor is his name. I'll tell you a bit more about him in a second. The reason why he's, he well, sorry, the reason why I invited him on today was I was uh, reading the Globe and Mail, a uh, newspaper in Canada, for those of you listening abroad. And there is a great article, and the headline was Seven Things You Should Never Say to an Indigenous Person. And I'm personally very interested in uh, learning more about um, uh, my interaction personally with uh, my friends who are Indigenous and learning more about uh, some of their perspectives and whatnot. And so I was very interested, interested to read the article. And then about halfway through, I was like, this is also uh, the dry wit in it was outstanding. And I love if you're familiar with uh, me and this podcast, you know, I really enjoy that uh, like a dry piece of humor. And Drew, uh, Drew's writing was just exemplary. And then when I learned about him, I was not surprised. So here's a bit of his bio. He's an award-winning playwright, novelist, filmmaker and journalist. He was uh, was born and still lives on the Curve Lake First Nation, which is just a bit outside of Peterborough. He has done everything from performing stand-up comedy at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., to serving as the artistic director of Canada's premier Indigenous theatre company, Native Earth Performing Arts. The author of, get this, 33 books. His next big project includes season two of the APTN documentary series, Going Native, a series he co-produced, co-wrote, and hosts, as well as the release of Me Tomorrow, the fourth in a series of nonfiction books exploring unexpected aspects of Indigenous culture. Uh, Drew, man, thanks. I, I really am honored. Thank you so much for making time for this today. Oh, you said that to all your guests. Well, I do, I, but I am honored. Like, you could be doing a lot of things right now, but, you know, here you are. So I, I do super appreciate that. Um, and also, I'm really excited to, you know, uh, people who listen to this podcast regularly know that we share questions in advance, so we can both be prepared. And I'm just really excited uh, to hear y- y- uh, your perspective and your thoughts and answers. Um, and one of the things, actually, that just uh, that just stood out from your article was <laughs> one of the points you made is, like, uh, don't and I, I'm going to paraphrase. It was like, don't uh, don't ask me if I know Sharon, who's indigenous, right? Maybe like asking, like you know, we all hit it as Canadians when we travel abroad, and like, oh, do you know Jim? He lives across the country. But also, there's another one where like somebody asked, well, what do you like the the royal you think of this? And you're like, I, there's like uh, sixty different languages and tribes, or more than that. Uh, they all have different uh, um, motivations. And needs and wants. So clearly, today when we have this conversation, I ha- I have that in mind. Like I'm talking to you about you and your point of views, but still, it's uh, so valuable. So, um, very sad news uh, was just uh, just came to the surface um, just before this podcast last week here in Toronto. So I'm dating this a bit. We're we're recording in early June 2021, and that was a discovery of the remains of 215 children at the site of a former residential school in Kamloops. And um, there is a time this may not have even been news in Canada, but today it has, which uh, in with tragic news like this is, is a positive sign that people care about it. So I think the question a lot of people have, I have from where you sit, what can Canadians do to be better allies and stay motivated to make Canada a better place for Indigenous populations? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, I don't have, there are entire libraries written on this and everybody, it's like a Rorschach test. Everybody has their own interpretation of what that journey is. I can't give you an answer for that. For me, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with education, having to understand. In reality, there are more similarities between our cultures than differences. And that's always important to keep. And it's those differences that I think makes us all unique and special and interesting. I cannot think of a more boring society than all one culture or one, 
one people, whatever, um, you know, and I, I grew up on a reserve, but as I was just telling you earlier, I love um, going out and getting Korean or Thai food. I mean, that has become so much a part of my life. And I shudder at the thought of the world without such unique and interesting uh, cuisine. So how to make it be a better ally, how to better understand is just to keep your, your ears open, your mouth shut to watch, to learn, to understand if we are, as a nation, as an Indigenous people, complaining about something, there's usually a good reason. We're not doing it just because we're bored mm. and it's a it's the afternoon on a, on a Tuesday. There's a very, very specific reason why we have issues with various aspects of Canadian culture. And I think one of the best way to help is to understand that, not to dismiss it, not to argue against it, but to take an, an objective look. And because chances are, I would say 99 times out of 100, people listen and do that. They will come away going, you know, I would probably feel the same way in the same situation. Yeah, no, 100%. Okay, so that I, I want to take that, uh, what you just talked about, and really hone in on something specific then. So oftentimes what happens with this podcast is there'll be somebody in a leader's, leadership position that will hear an idea or hear like an actionable item. And I get an email back a few weeks or a few months later saying, oh, I tried that thing and I did it. So right now I know, because it's, it's happening with clients that I work with, you know, um, there's a there's a drive in organization saying, oh, we want to, you know, uh, we want to you know, support uh, Indigenous people. We want to do like uh, some social action in our organization. And what I see happens in whether, you know, swap out whatever it is for whatever, you know, if it was the environment two years ago, the environment. And what happens is, is these companies like spring into action and they think they're doing good. So I'm wondering, just based on what you just said right there, like learning, and there's not one answer. If a, uh, what do you see out there? Like when you see um, non non-Indigenous people trying to do that, do the education, do the learning. What does that look like? And I'm thinking like, so a, so a person who makes decisions on this sort of thing can hear this and be like, okay, that's good. That points me in the right direction. Like, where do they go? What what kind of things should they be thinking about or doing? Well, I, th uh, I thought I answered that by keeping your ears open, learning, understanding people around you, understanding the perspective, why they're doing what they're doing and how to best assist them in their particular journey to reconciliation and um, and making Canada a better place for both for both nations. Okay. No, you did. Sorry, you did answer that. That's right. So, is there like have you seen a good example of that in practice? You could tell us about. Oh God, uh, not really. I mean, I know it exists. I don't. I don't scribble this stuff down. Yeah. Um, you know, we, and we most people are more tend to. Remember the stuff that doesn't work, that the stuff that mm. does work. One of the interesting things I find that allies, so-called allies, then when they think they're being empowering, then in, but in reality they're not, is that wonderful phrase a lot of BIPOC people do not like. It's the phrase, I don't see color. Oh, yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? Because yeah, that is, no, that is totally. like the worst thing you can say to yeah. somebody. Yeah, because, yes, to I totally get you. Well, keep going, though. Keep ex Explain. Yeah. So flesh something that like that, everywhere. right? It's like, yes, I understand where you're coming from, where you're saying, you know, you think that's a good thing, but it's actually not because our color is a, is, is a characteristic of who we are, where we come from, our, our place in society, how we're viewed by society. And if you don't see it, that's a comment on you yes. because we see it in so yeah. many different ways. Yeah. I find that so tone deaf. Like, um, so I, uh, uh, my good friend, Tristan, he was on a few, we had a, a few episodes ago. He, I call him the not only non white guy in this place called Karen Park, Saskatchewan. It's a little tiny town used to be a former military base. And we were talking and we were talking about this very topic, how people at uh, his town will say that to him. And he's like, well, you know, um, your neighbor, when I go into the grocery store and they just stare at me, they see color, right? Like, so they're being more honest about it than you are. And I was like, yeah. wow, that is such good perspective. Like to, to say like, oh, I don't see color and I'm helping you. Like, no, it's very toned. I totally get it. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things too, is that, um, we, uh, I'm always curious about, and I forgive me if I've done this, so it's not my intention, but like you're an artist, right? And I, some might argue. 
<laughs> exactly. I've been accused of doing that. Yeah. Um, now, you may have done this, but you may not have. So I don't want to come from a place of um, a place of uh, assumption. Like when you were growing up and you discovered that you had a talent and you found joy in this, were you probably were you or were you not thinking like, oh, I I am. Uh, I want to write about Canada's First Nations, or did this just happen organically? Was this something that kind of you were driven by, or was it just a thing? Well, I, when I wanted to, I discovered when I was young, I wanted to be a writer. But at that time, you know, as I always tell people, I'm a thousand years old. Mm. Uh, when I was growing up, we had two or three television stations, and I, I, I say this, and a lot of younger people don't understand me when I say that those stations were very snowy. Yes. <laughs> um, and so I would read a lot. And the more I read, the more I realized I wanted to be a writer because I love the concept of writing. You know, you're creating a work of art out of a figment of your imagination. It is very cool, very wonderful. And it's what I want to do. And one of the great things about being a writer is the universe that you create, you have more control over that universe than you have of the universe you live in. Mm. And I kind of like that. However, in school, we never studied any Indigenous literature. There was no Indigenous right. literature that was in our school, that was in our library. So I wasn't sure Indigenous people wrote. And I remember asking some people, I asked my grade 11 English teacher if it was possible to make a living from creative writing. And without looking up from his desk, he said, no, not really. And my mother said uh, she didn't understand why I wanted to be a writer. It wouldn't get me anywhere. So I gave up wanting to be a writer. So I would wanted to be a writer as a kid, but the older I got, it became apparent to me that there wasn't much point in being a writer. So I gave it up and I didn't re-embrace my art until I was at least in my mid twenties. Mm. So, um, you know, it wasn't a really a burning pain when I was young because it had been stamped out, but it's so much not a case of me finding my art. My art had to track me down, kick me in the ass and say, you're a writer, snap out of it, now get writing. But I think that on the other hand, the good part of that is it gave me a chance to, to season, to age like a good wine, like a good cheese, because I really didn't have much to write about. I didn't know if I, I probably wasn't a good writer when I was young. I needed to get out, have my heart broken, see the world before I became a writer. And it all turned out, it all turned out for the best. Okay. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm really excited about, the way I describe myself, is I'm a contemporary storyteller. Mm. It used to be, we, you know, story to, storytelling was an oral job, an, an oral um, uh, way of, of, of telling stories. And then gradually, as uh, civilizations grew and changed, we, it went into um, theater, it went into print, it went into television, it went into radio, it went into movies. And in today's day and age, even video games now have intricate and deep narratives oh, yeah. within them. So I, I and I work in so many different fields. As I said, I'm a playwright, I'm a novelist, short story writer, I do nonfiction, I do documentaries, television. Um, I consider myself a contemporary storyteller because there's so many different ways to tell stories in this day and age. And I'm still I'm still exploring as many of them as I can. And okay, so. There's a great commercial. Uh, I've seen it. I think it plays in front of movies, or I forget where I've seen it. But it's um, a black actor who uh, is saying, "Like, hey, gatekeepers, those who like write the plays, like my first uh, or my, in movies and television shows, my first five years of editions were all like drug dealer, gang member, etc., yeah. etc." So, like, when you were when you were like coming up as a writer. Were you finding, were people expecting a certain kind of content from you? Or was that because, because writing is sometimes um, anonymous from, uh, from seeing somebody at least, did you not find that? Well, I remember I wrote an episode of a show called um, Street Legal. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. And they cut, the, the, I, I actually saw notes from the story editor to the other writers, from the producer to the story editors on a native character I'd written saying, cut back on his lines and make him sound more Indian. Uh. And so he was walking around going, always you ask questions, all this sort of uh. weird stuff that annoyed the hell out of me. And I also worked on North of 60, which was an, a horrible experience where they basically just rewrote everything. So, um, 
you know, and, and and the interesting is that today I'm known for obvious reasons. I'm known as the native writer. Um, uh, I get called in to work on native projects, which isn't a bad thing. I don't mind that. It's the world I know. Um, but I frequently get asked, do I ever want to work on projects that have absolutely nothing to do with with the indigenous culture? Right? And I go, yeah, I would love to. Yeah, There's course. a wonderful writer down in the States named Rebecca Roanhorse, mm-hmm. who wrote a very um, amazing award-winning science fiction fantasy novel called um, Trail of Lightning. And it's, it takes place on the Navajo reservation. And it's what would happen after uh, some apocalyptic environmental problem where the Navajo reservation builds a wall around itself to keep all the hungry white people out. But because of this, whatever happened, all the Navajo gods and demons come back to life. So it's these people living a regular everyday existence on a, on a reserve, suddenly having to deal with these pesky gods and demons. And it's, it, it won all the major science fiction awards and it was so good that she was hired by Star Wars to write a Star Wars novel. Mm. And she did. Yeah. And I mean, that's one of the kind of dreams I have, except I'm more of a Star Trek fan than a Star Wars fan. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that kind of thing I would love to do. I'm very happy writing, writing indigenous stories. Um, and, you know, and I, what's really interesting about this time in history is the concept of genre writing. It used to be that in the indigenous community, indigenous writers, there are basically three themes that were coming out of the Indigenous community, both in terms of novels, plays, um, poetry, etc. There were either historical narratives, um, victim narratives, or stories exploring the concept of um, post-contact stress disorder. But in the last 10, 15 years, there's this, been this, this explosion of genre fiction where Indigenous people are culturally appropriating all these different genres of fiction from the dominant culture and indigenizing them. So you have um, people writing, uh, Daniel Heath Justice wrote a trilogy that's basically his version of Lord of the Rings, where there are dwarves and, and elves and swords and magic. Um, another friend of mine wrote, a collection of indigenous, international indigenous erotica. Huh. Uh, Tom King, when he's not writing um, award-winning fiction, nonfiction, his hobby is writing murder mysteries, hmm. right? And now there's this big explosion of indigenous science fiction. Um, Wabagija Grice wrote a book called Moon of the Crested Snow, which is more of an apocalyptic book. Sherry Demerlane wrote a book called The Marrow Thieves, um, um, which was uh, highly successful. I wrote a collection of indigenous science fiction short stories. My first novel was a native vampire novel. I'm just about to sell my new novel, which is an indigenous horror novel. Mm-hmm. So what's happening right now is really exciting is we're beginning to, to tell our stories, not just in those original three themes, but the sky's the limit. Very cool. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things when I was uh, in my like 20 or 21, I spent a couple of summers uh, just north of Perry Sound, and I met a guy that was a social worker. He was indigenous, and he was a social worker. And we would meet like I'd have my days off. He just happened to be in the ca- hang out at the cafe, and he would tell me stories. And what I and like you know, he's a great storyteller about his work. Right. Like, what What I found awesome about it was like he wasn't telling me indigenous stories. He was telling me stories, but were flavored by his experiences. Yeah. And it really grew me to appreciate like that thing. I don't know, have a word for it. It's like, and I love that you say like, of course I'll take other work. I'm a writer. That's what I want to do. I mean, stupid to turn down. Well, I mean, I mean, the interesting thing about this whole thing is say at the end of the day, when I go home from wherever I happen to be, yeah, 95% of the books I read, the television I watch are, are, are mainstream. Yeah. Um, uh, um, Stories like you know, I watch The Simpsons, Big Bang Theory, etc., and I enjoy them and I laugh. And ninety percent of the people who buy my novels and go see my plays, just because of the ratio of non-native people to, na- to native people, ninety percent of the people who are familiar who read my work are actually non-native. Yeah. So again, I keep going about there are more similarities than differences. That's amazing. So people can enjoy the stuff I write because I enjoy the stuff other people write, other uh, um, non-native writers write. Um. I'm going to, it's behind a paywall, but it's worth this global mail subscription. I'm going to put a link to the article um, 
I read of yours, uh, the seven things you you never say to an indigenous person. And that what reminded me to do that is uh, you talk about some of your friends who have appropriated like that talk exclusively in Simpsons quotes. Um, I thought that was, I have those Simpsons and Star Trek quotes. Star Trek quotes. I have those same friends. Um, but listen, you know, one of the things, so those are some pretty, like I, you have this line in there. It's like, well, what, what can we do? And you're like, well, how about stop making our woman disappear? Like, you said but so what i what i'm curious about is like how do you take these subjects that are heavy and i think i I, through talking to you i think i know how but i'd love for you to articulate it from your your viewpoint how you do these topics that are so heavy but you write it in a way that is so approachable and it's because of humor is that just the way you were raised or is that something that you've you've crafted over the years well oftentimes humor is is an um... I'm going to say the word the indigenous way, but it's all cultures that, you know, yeah. use humor to both comment on and reflect the harm of society. Mm. How I do this, how anybody does this, I don't know. There's no formula for it. I can't give you, I tell you how I do it. It's just, you know, experience. I mean, there's that, that famous Woody Allen, um, I think, quote, you know, tragedy plus time equals comedy. Right. <laughs> Right. You know, there's there's so many different ways. I can't tell you how, how I do it. You know, there's some st- stuff where you go, no, I can't do that. It's either too soon or that is not funny. Like this, the whole thing about the two 215 in Kamloops. I can't, don't know how to make that funny unless you make a really ironic black reference to something using that term. But it's like something I wouldn't want to try right now. Mm. Yeah. You know, that is. Uh, yeah. You know. That is great. I I also find uh, because I've been accused of being funny sometimes and I just find like I look at things and I see humor in a lot of it right away. And that could be maybe that's a coping mechanism. I don't know. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel the same way because people say, how do you be so funny? It's like, I don't know, man. Like, it's just I also I ingest a lot of humor right like i you know it's funny you know i i was thinking like it's a two references to snowy channels and street legal could you imagine like uh if you want to binge watch street legal back in the day you'd have to like commit four years and watch uh every thursday night or whatever it was yeah yeah um man so uh three decades of writing you've been celebrated which i think is fair to say you've been awarded You've traveled the world. What uh, I mentioned a few things you're working on um, in your uh, introduction, but what do you have on the go right now? Because you, before we started recording, you mentioned a few things you were working on. You you wrote like 400 plays or something during the pandemic as well. I wrote two plays during the pandemic. We're going to be workshopping them hopefully August September. Um, I have Me Tomorrow coming out I think in September October. And hopefully my new novel, as I said, I'm waiting to find out. I have a meeting on Friday with a publisher about it. Um, I'm in pre-production to, uh, to start shooting um, uh, season two of Going Native. Um, I, I've done. I'm still writing articles for the for the Globe. There are just so many things. I mean, my my mind is constantly going, going. I adapted one of my plays into a screenplay. Um, just a few things hanging around. You know, the, here's one. Here's one reflection I want to just say very pa- plainly for people that that look like me and might sound like me, you might be tempted, uh, and this is my learning, you might be tempted when you are, when you meet somebody like Drew, so you're like, oh, indigenous? Oh, writer? Um, how can I, how can we work, get you to do indigenous writing things for us? And what I want to encourage you with, man, like, honestly, like I promised uh, Drew like 20 to 30 minutes, but I could easily take up his whole afternoon just like, shooting the poop uh because i've laughed i need i need some good laughter today i've laughed so my my learning for you if you look like me and sound like me is like uh drew's a dude who writes that's so I hear, the irony here being too is like i also look like you well you, i know you wrote about that in your story too but you're like whatever it's but it's not yeah you know what i mean and so but that's you know um yeah like that's that's how People are people, they care about what they care about. And I think if you approach, and it's not about not seeing color, definitely be aware of it. But um, it's not about like, oh, oh, there's a, 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 a person who's not white. Well, let me let me make sure to make sure that, that they get the front seat in any question I have about this. 
that's not necessarily the right way. Uh, let people be themselves. And also, I love the idea that take every opportunity. You know, I say this to people often, um, clients, when I'm like, for example, right now, privacy online is a big thing in changing the way companies can do marketing. So I've been saying, if you read articles or hear anything about how to um, still build great email lists while Apple is blocking your ability to get an email from a user, like put it aside, just put it in your pocket. Let's talk about it next time we meet. So I would encourage you to, if read the globe, read Drew stuff, read other uh, authors and write ingest other uh, media. So that's what I'd say. But Drew, thank you so much for being here today. It was a pleasure. It was fun, sir. Before we go, I just want to thank the people that put this together. Um, Austin Pomeroy, man, he's the audio editor. He does a great job. Jeff Anhorn takes this video, makes it look great. Jamie Hunter is our social media manager. You probably, our social, oh, sorry, our content manager. He, If you saw this, you probably saw it online and he did all that work. Sam Forson did all the graphic designs for the post, for the podcast logo. Uh, Cindy Craig does all the booking. Um, uh, Carrie Cotton is our account manager. And at, as I do this podcast, she keeps the company running. So I appreciate it. And Naomi Grossman helps with research and writing the questions. None of this. I just sit here and get to talk. It's amazing. I have the best job at all of this. So thank you, everybody who helped put this together. And Drew, again, thank you. We will see you next time. Oh, before I go, where can people find out more about you? Where can they, where should they go? What's it, aside from Googling your name? Uh, well, yeah, I'm all, over the, I'm all over the net. You can go to my website, drewhaydentaylor.com. Uh, that's a good beginning. Okay, cool. All right, and we will see you next time. And I'm on Twitter. Andrew, oh yeah, oh my gosh, dude. There is one as I was getting ready. Okay, I just have to, I have to pull this up. Um, you had one today that made me howl. Uh, oh yeah, I, I love this about. Uh, so I'm gonna read this is uh, tweets read out loud by Matthew Ewell, Drew Hayden Taylor. I'm envisioning a musical called Egerton Ryerson, sort of a cross between Sweeney Todd, Don't Eat His Indian Tacos, and Fender the Opera, where he'll be prowling the secret corridors of the university, wondering what indigenous people are doing there. <laughs> I loved it. That was so good, man. I loved it. Okay, that is all. Check it out. I'll talk to you guys again. Bye-bye.